Good morning, everybody, and welcome to Get Secure. I'm your host, Mike Blangiforti, and today I'm joined by a special guest, uh, Mr. Scott Downs. Hey, Scotty. Yeah. Welcome All again. Right. Thanks Thank for you. coming back again. If you remember, Scott was here uh, last week, and we were talking about uh, school safety, and we only lightly touched on some global events and how they impact things here on the home front. So we're going to continue that dialogue today because uh, truth be told, Scott, I wanted to ask you a lot more about global events and their impact on homeland security. But before we get into this, um, I, I want to switch gears a little bit to emergency management. As everybody knows out there, yesterday a number of tornadoes uh, touched down in the Midwest um, over a span of several states, Oklahoma, Kansas, um, 18 people dead as a result of these storms. It seems, Scott, that no matter what we do with these devastating tornadoes and all of the technology, the warning systems, um, and everything that we have in today's advanced technology, that you know our folks are still getting killed uh, from these terrible storms. And when you look at the devastation that the tornadoes cause, I mean, it's like a war zone. And um, so I just wanted to talk to you um, about you know, our areas of expertise are in emergency management. There are four phases to emergency management, which we're going to talk about briefly. Um, mitigation, preparation, response, and recovery. And certainly with natural disasters, um, these four phases, all four, uh, play a very important part in addressing these. Let's talk about these tornadoes. Uh, yeah, Mother Nature has no friends when it comes to this. They do some damage, damaging effects, um, high velocity of winds. And again, what happens is going back to the emergency management phase, the mitigation part of it, the preparing to lessen the risk of these things happening, really comes down to planning and preparing for it. Um, yes, unfortunately, um, they are cost they're, cost they're costly in some aspects, but they are cost effective in the long run if you see the damages that these houses do. Um, in the Midwest, they did have the alert system for days that people um, were notified that they are most likely going to either come or affect somewhere. Mm -hmm. um, yes, they're unprepared in the aspect of do we know exactly when and how mm -hmm. and all the devastation that's going to happen. But this is what, um, in today's day and age, in today's technology, um, when you look at you know, the Doppler radar, there's this things that we definitely have today that we didn't have uh, back when. Um, and, you know, we talk about uh, mitigation or prevention, you know, preventing a tornado, an earthquake from happening. You can't, you can't do it. That phase almost doesn't come into play um, with a tornado or an earthquake. It's hard to prevent it. But preparedness, the second phase of emergency ma management, folks are prepared. I mean, they have the shelters. They have the early warning systems. What can we do? Um, the unfortunate part of this is a lot of times is um, a lot of people don't really recognize that or well, they take the warning system seriously. Um, we will go back to Katrina when I had friends that lived in New Orleans. Mm -hmm. For 10 years prior to that, they were like, ah, we never evacuated. We, didn't, we stayed. That one, they were like, well, this one's really coming. And they did get up and they moved further north. They moved, you know, they got on the Amtrak train, the free yeah. ticket. Yeah. And they went. So again, if you... My best advice is if you live in an area where you have friends and families that you know that during that a warning sign area where the Doppler radar gives you that red area where all oh, these tornadoes are definitely going to hit, I recommend that you do leave that area for safety for you, your family. Is it feasible for everybody? No. But it's probably one of the best things because you are preparing for it in that sense, whether you have a suitcase packed or you know what's coming, the warning signs are earlier. I mean, with a hurricane, yeah, absolutely. We, there's a little bit of lead time. The way these tornadoes pop up, I mean, anywhere, and then they have the, uh, the F scale, you know, from F1 to F5 being the most devastating, and you see the damage that they do. I mean, lifting houses, tractor trailers off the ground, throwing them, um, and, but people are still getting killed. And it's, uh, so you can't be, uh, you can't be overprepared for something like that happening. And you can definitely not adopt the philosophy that it won't happen uh, to you. And we're coming into that season now. Um, but so, okay, so the mitigation, can't do it, not with a tornado. Um, not going to stop it from happening. It's, it's going to happen. The preparedness, okay, shelters, uh, Doppler radar, evacuation routes, 
okay, prepared, a, a cache of food or something like that maybe in the shelter, and water, um, preparedness, um, response. I can't imagine being the first responder to that, Scotty. We didn't handle that in the NYPD. Yeah, um, you brought up very valid points um, that I, I totally agree with you. Yes, the sheltering. Um, I would assume building codes in certain areas there. I would now or Probably that, much different than... Yeah, yeah New York. Um, basements. Um, we can go back to the Wizard of Oz. How funny in Kansas. Okay, we're all going to go into the, the cellar. the first tornado that I remember uh, seeing um, was, was on television. and It happened to be that movie. And, um, and I remember watching it as a kid saying, oh my gosh, is that something that's real? And, and it really is. Well, that's why I said if we go back to uh, recently on the news, Kansas was, I think, one of the states that was hit. And yes. it was funny. Not fu it was funny in a sense where, wow, they, you know, they do have the cellars. So I would assume that people being prepared in their cellars, they do have um, water. They do have canned foods. Mm -hmm. You have to prepare yourself for an incident of this magnitude because they do pop up frequently or out of nowhere that cause these massive damages. And as a first responder, yeah, just think about the the debris and the house wreckage, how do you get around as a first responder? How do you actually respond to an incident that's almost, you're unable to get to? How do you know where the victims are? How do you know, you see, you see tractor trailers I being- I saw what happened with the mudslide in uh, Washington state and to be a first responder, responding to something like a natural disaster is much different than responding to a, a crime or even an electrical emergency or, or a fire or something like that. A natural disaster, what do you, um, uh, what, what's the staging area? How do you get in? Where are the victims? How do we identify where they are? So the response is critical. Now, and, 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 and the law enforcement professionals and the first responders in the Midwest, I'm certain, have a different type of training, a different mindset when they're responding to an emergency like this. Yeah, the only natural uh, disaster that I have a, a, a vast knowledge is I have a few friends that do uh, forest fire rain, uh, training that go to, they mobilize wherever the fire is. Brush fire is another natural disaster. Amazing though, I mean their training is uh, parallel to none. Um, mm -hmm. They tell me the training that they do is, uh, is well above their scope of what regular firemen do. But again, going back to that as a first responder, mm -hmm. how do you respond to something where you don't know where the victims are? You don't know the damage that is out there. You don't know if there's live wires for you electrically. Right. The, we all have to take this all into account. Um, I think the phase, the four phases of emergency management work in all aspects of it, but it must be a collaboration. We must collaborate from beginning to end now because we don't really know how to plan for something that is really no set protocol. Yeah, I mean, well, we spoke about education last week when we were talking about uh, you know school violence and. You know, it's, it's education here, too, in emergency management. I don't think enough folks out there understand the four phases. And, and I, I think there needs to be a little bit more training uh, regarding this. But right now, uh, out west, they're involved in the recovery phase. Um, and the recovery phase um, is, is one of the most difficult phases, and whether it's something where you're recovering from an active shooter scenario and what happens with the families, the victims of the families, and how does an institution or a workplace recover from something so tragic happening? It's the same thing with a natural disaster. Now they're in the recovery phase, and what's happening right now in the recovery phase, Scott, is, you know, I mean, they're trying to find more victims. Uh, and recovery is, uh, you know, sometimes it's a terrible word. Um, you know, I remember in 9-11 when it went from a rescue operation to a recovery operation, things seem grim. Yeah, the wording sometimes um, has a social or a connotative meaning to people involved. Um, going back to uh, what they're doing across state lines is they have a multi-agency, multi-jurisdictional um, packs that each agency is coming together to help each other out with who has the best resources to um, deal with certain situations in this area near certain states. Um, if you go back to like um, when during the snowstorm this winter in North Carolina, they didn't have any plows. Yeah. So, again, there is a lot of mutual agreement among uh, jurisdictions, which yeah, I find. Collaborative effort. Yes, and I think that's great. That is a big part now of emergency management, where we do actually have these mutual agreements among different agencies, and it seems to be working out great. Um, again, unfortunately, we have no set protocol for like, these type of things, because what kind of protocol do you do when you can't get down seven blocks because you don't know where any victims are? Um, you don't know who evacuated, who evacuated the area, who stayed in their homes. We don't know where to look for victims. So it's definitely a, a huge task. 
for local first responders. And we saw during Superstorm Sandy um, the reluctance of residents to listen to authorities and leave their residence when it's the right thing to do to evacuate. People have trouble um, leaving their valuables behind and listening to what would you and I be a common sense. Yeah, they also attach to their pets, but we also have to take into account as emergency managers, you have to worry about the elderly, you have to worry about medication. Mm -hmm. See, these are, all goes back to the mitigation phase. You as an individual have to be responsible for what we are going to do as a family. Right. How, where are we going to go? Do we have, you know, documents in a waterproof box? Do we have, um, you know, cash set aside? Do we have enough water? All these things are something that a lot of times you need to plan way in advance may not always be effective, but at least it's in place. You have some kind of guidelines and you have a set thing, and that goes back to the education part. Prepare, 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 because planning is great, but when the planning is, comes into preparedness, you actually need it. Absolutely. If you have a plan, you'll be prepared, because you, it, I always say it's like rope, rope memory. You train, you practice, rehearse, during a crisis situation, your recall and your memory is instant because you already have it done. Right. And as is the theme of this show is uh, get secure, certainly uh, emergency management, how it affects you and how you respond to an emergency, how you could prevent something from happening, how you could be well prepared uh, for something happening, how do, would you respond when something does happen, and then how do we recover uh, when something has happened, everything is over, how do we recover from it. So the theme of this show, Get Secure, certainly natural disaster is something, and certainly we have some important safety tips um, that we would love to uh, share with you. Um, and if you'd like to tweet me, uh, I'm at BlangifM on Twitter, at B-L-A-N-G-I-F-M on Twitter. Be happy to share uh, some of the knowledge, uh, industry knowledge that I have and some of the experts that I have on the show with all of you. So now switching gears, uh, Scotty, and getting back to where we left off last week, um, we only touched on what's going on in the Ukraine. And because it's an evolving situation, it's still going on. Um, what impact does it have on our home front, on homeland security? President Obama just put increased sanctions now on Russia in responding to their um, well, first the incursion in Crimea, and now the further aggression into uh, the Ukraine. What say you? Um, yes, a lot of people don't realize that these um, crisis situations affect us economically and politically throughout the world. Um, economically, if you see now, um, our crude oil has risen, so it does affect us on the home front as individuals. So again, the economic impacts that it has um, and the political ramification it has throughout the world is we are uh, the world stage on what goes on in the world. People watch everything the United States does. Um, President Obama, yes, he came down this morning with some more uh, sanctions. Um, I think he put in uh, seven uh, sanctions on uh, mm -hmm. Russian officials that are close to uh, President Putin's. Yeah, I saw uh, that. And the uh, 17 uh, major companies that are affiliated with Russian thing. Um, not only do the United States need to actually um, do harder sanctions, so does the EU. European nations have to sometimes put a big bite into it. Um, like Russia has natural gas. They are not, we need to work jointly with our sanctions as well, but Europe has we have to, to work with our allies. Yes, they have to. They have to get on board with us, otherwise our sanctions have no bite. What about violence uh, here in the United States because of what's happening in the Ukraine? It also kind of plays hand in hand with what's going on right now. In, um, in Israel, you know, the, the talks have broken down again between um, Israel and, uh, and Pakistan, um, the, uh, and Palestine, Palestine. sorry, <laughs> uh, between Israel and Palestine. It's a war that's been going on forever. Um, talks have broken down again. But some of the impacts that that has on our home front is, you know, we have Palestinian Americans, we have Israeli Americans, Israel being one of America's closest allies and it could spark violence here. Do you share the same concern with the Ukraine? We have Ukrainian Americans, we have Russian Americans here. Could there be conflict here? Um, only time will tell with that. Um, from the vast amount of people that I've spoken to about the Ukraine, they really align more with the Western philosophy. They, they align more with us. They align with the idea of they want a free democratic state. 
Um, the Russian Americans here, I would assume that they, ideologically, they do align with us only because they are here. I mean, only time will tell on that aspect. But if you go back to um, the two aspects of it, people are asking, is it going to be the height of the Cold War again? Are we starting to? It may not be like the Berlin Wall because it's right in the heart of Russia. It so concerns me, though. Yeah, uh, uh, it's not something that I would, I would definitely keep an eye on because of the fact it's like North Korea again now with the fourth possible missile launch. I Something mean, to gosh, watch. I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean, North Korea, South Korea, Palestine, <clears throat> Israel, Ukraine, Russia. There's global events happening right now that I, I, I believe definitely will impact our home front in one way or another. Putin, thug or, uh, or thug or somebody who's taking advantage of a weak president? Um, I could play devil's advocate on this. If you look at uh, the Russian home front, um, statistically, 72% of his population love him as a president. Um, does he use thug mentality in that? So again, if I separate myself as a leader for his country, they're looking at him as he's a, a, a great leader. Um, looking at it from our point of view, yes, he's a thug. I mean, again, trying to take away people's freedoms and... He's certainly, he's certainly not furthering global democracy <laughs> in what no. he's doing. No, absolutely not. But then you could, we could also talk about, we can go to the Israeli-Palestine problem. Again, the peace talks break down again. This is not something new. This is, a, le this is a, a problem that can be explained easier than it could be decided on how to come up with real resolutions for it to end. Um, Benjamin Netanyahu has, in my opinion, really tried to bridge the gap and really give certain concessions to make the Palestinian people happy. Um, it's just, again, how do you align with an ideology that wants you destroyed? Again. They don't want to even acknowledge that you exist. So, and you know, I mean, and, uh, Israel has uh, you know other concerns regarding with Iran. Um, so, uh, you know, and then now Iran has kind of slipped out of the media cycle with everything that's going on. But also a real concern: you're developing a nuclear weapon, and how uh, Israel may respond to that. And then will all the allies be on board if, God forbid, something happens there? But the, um, the, what's happening around the globe, um, to speak more to your area of expertise, what's happening around the globe and all the things that we just touched on, um, what can we do here in the United States um, to keep our folks secure? I mean, obviously, we're very proactive. We're also very reactive. But um, I just, my own opinion, I see yes, these sir. global events having an impact on the homeland. and. Um, I just want to get your thoughts. But uh, you're 100% right on the effects of homelands. Hopefully we never have to see it here on the actual home front. There are a lot of things that we can do in retrospect with sanctions. We can actually look at um, the renewal of the missile defense in Czechoslovakia and, and uh, the Poland. That's a big thing for Russia. These are things that, yes, they're on the home front, but they actually are something that's a, a, a foreign issue that needs to be. So our foreign policy as leadership needs to really go far above and beyond so it never hits our shores. Will people do things, that is my biggest concern, that yes, going back to the Russian population, will there be a lone wolf? Will there be an active terrorist from a single individual? I hope not, but that is one thing that we have to look at. It's also one thing that does concern me about you know, the global events is that um, you know, we talk all the time about a lone wolf uh, terrorist, and a lone wolf terrorist essentially is somebody that's not on the radar, uh, we don't know who it is. Um, it's, it, it's probably not an extremist in terms of like a Muslim extremist or something like that. And it's just somebody who will do uh, harm without regard for their own life or without regard for the life of anybody else. So it's certainly a concern that we have. Um, and what's to stop a lone wolf? It's the biggest challenge, really, uh, for law enforcement and for our investigators. But I'm going to switch gears again. <laughs> So, I was just going to reiterate what you said, okay. a lone wolf. A lot of people don't realize that a lone wolf is, it could be an individual, it could be a group. I mean, there's eco-terrorists, there are a number of groups, domestic terrorist groups like the KKK. There are certain areas of, that people just don't think, don't lull, don't lull it into just an international group or Al-Qaeda or Hamas. It's, mm -hmm. Again, you hit the nail right on the head when you said that it's not just... That it's the biggest law enforcement problem because of a copycat yeah. or a lone wolf. Yeah, and that's what concerns me the most. Was what concerns all law enforcement professionals the most. Okay, so um, Malaysian Flight 370. Um, 
this uh, this plane is the biggest mystery, Scott, that I've seen. I, I, I think in all my years of investigative experience, all my years in emergency management experience, um, and with the technology that we have out there today, this plane is nowhere to be found. Um, and now the Prime Minister of Malaysia came out with a statement, I believe yesterday, now blaming the, that they can't locate the plane on Boeing, the manufacturers of uh, the aircraft. And Mike, maybe you could bring up the graphic of, uh, of what the plane looks like, the Boeing 777, um, which maybe we'll get to next week. Um, but you know, just uh, the, the Malaysian Prime Minister is now blaming Boeing for that they can't locate the plane. Uh, it, it's the biggest mystery. And you, and you have your conspiracy theorists out there, you know, and I don't buy into too many conspiracy theories, but for you, Scott, does it make you change your mind in any way that they haven't found a scrap of this airplane? Does it give, does it give any of the conspiracy theorists Credibility. The plane landed. Uh, <laughs> aliens uh, snatched the plane up into the sky. Um, uh, one thing I must say that the governments and private companies are going far well and beyond what they're doing to find us. The plane has been gone now for 52 days, which is kind of amazing. Um, the recovery or the response effort to finding this plane is amazing. I know the U.S. Navy has its what they call uh, the Dolphin Fin 21. That goes to almost 2.8 miles below sea mm -hmm. below uh, uh, sea level to find any kind of area. They've actually um, estimated now it goes a six mile radius. They can find up to this, the blocks in the, the Indian Ocean where they've been looking. Um, it's truly amazing. They said they're bring bring in private companies and the recovery effort's almost at 55 million dollars. Mm. That is you know astronomical amount of money for a, a plane. The conspiracy theorists, I guess, until we find that the only thing I can say that I know from past in uh, France 442 mm -hmm. in 2009, it took them almost two years to find the plane, and it was about six and a half miles off the grid that they actually thought where the plane was. So there is some kind of. But what uh, the Air France one, did, did, did they, didn't they find something though early on? Yes, they that, did. That's the only difference. Yes. Yeah. I, I, again, I'm just trying to be optimistic because I'm an optimist yeah. by nature. Mm -hmm. Because again, yes, the technology aspect of it, where how we do not, we, can, we, we can't line, locate a single item from the plane. That's a little interesting at this point. Um, yes, I understand that, you know, um, Waterways have an interesting funneling system, but we'll never know. Well, there's so much. Uh, there's so much in the ocean depth, and uh, I've I've spoken on uh, previous shows about what they call the topography, which is basically what does the ocean look like on the on, on the floor and all the uh, valleys and crevices, and it's almost like it could, it could be like little mini mountain ranges on, on, under there, three three miles down. Now imagine just in your head for a second that a car going. 60 miles an hour takes three full minutes to go uh, three miles. Uh, could you imagine driving your car three miles down into uh, the the ocean? I mean, it, at 60 miles an hour, three minutes, uh, that's, that's deep, Scott, that's <laughs> deep. That's why when I said the uh, United States has this, uh, you know, the Dolphin 21, uh, the Bluefin 21, Two point eight miles deep is amazing, um, but again, trying to locate the box, the problem that comes with that is the battery. The aspect of how long will the battery keep pinging? Mm -hmm. um, this is something that again we have to decide. What other technology can we possibly use? Video radar has not worked. Uh, yeah, again, I mean, it's, I just, it's one of those mysteries that I, I guess only time will tell when we can scratch our head and say, "Wow, we need to learn from this." I just feel terrible for for the uh, for the victims' families. Um, they don't have closure yet. This thing was bungled from the beginning. Um, my opinion. You know. Yeah. Well, I, the one thing that I did uh, that I thought was a little. Um, Heartless was a text message to the family members that, yeah, I was like, I was, I was one of those like, wow, I was really, that's like, you know, texting me, Mike, I can't make your show two minutes before the show. It's, that was a little hot. It was heartless. Yeah. It, was, it was disgusting um, how, they, how they handled that. Um, but I, I don't know. This consp the only conspiracy theory that I would even entertain is could the plane have landed somewhere? 
We know that it was up in the air longer than it was supposed to be up in the air, flying around for several hours. We know all these things, but we can't find a scrap of uh, the airplane. Um, and, you know, I know the ocean is vast, um, and, and I, but something in a plane is, is going to float with our satellite imagery, with radar, with everything that we have. I, I just, I, I'm, I'm having a very difficult time putting my arms around this one. I think that's why the Malaysian government and the Australian government now has reached out to private companies to help with this because I, I think they've tried, they've used every resource possible to them without going into the public sector now. That, so now they're bringing the public sector on board. Yes, it's gonna cost a lot more money. Yeah, I would assume. Um, but I guess, like you said, until we find out something, the only thing is I could be optimistic on the idea that it took almost two, over two years to find something from the Air France flight. So I, I think that is a good thing. Um, well, I mean, listen, I don't think the efforts are ever going to stop. Um, not until this, um, until they find something. I just think that the, uh, the management of the whole uh, thing has been mismanaged, bungled. We spoke about that last time. That was the only thing that I think that maybe other governments should have reached out to people that have a, a better knowledge or an enhanced knowledge right. of this kind of investigation. Mm -hmm. Because again, when you wait, those valuable, and you know as, a, as an investigator, those first couple days are extremely important to an investigation. Mm -hmm. So again, we don't know if someone missed something. Hopefully now the experts or the private companies will go over and over mm -hmm. the satellite imagery, uh, the flight path, the, trying to find the flight recorder, the black, I, I mean... Well, that, that thing is, I mean, they stopped pinging. They, they seem to have, they had it narrowed down to 16 square miles in the vastness of the Indian Ocean. But it's, it's we, we still don't have it. And, you know, Scott, I don't, I don't know, um, and I'm not comfortable that we ever will um, right now. But the efforts continue, and we'll talk more about it, you know, hopefully in future shows. Um, so I want to thank you, uh, you know, for coming on today. We have to wrap up uh, for today's show. But um, you're certainly, again, um, topical things that we like to talk about on Get Secure, you know, from natural disasters to uh, global events and how they impact the home front um, to, uh, you know, taking a look from an investigatory standpoint on what could have happened to Malaysia Flight 370. And we try to uh, put this all into a 30-minute uh, window, uh, but I do try to get in as much as I can in every show. So um, that's it for this week of Get Secure. Scott, thanks again for coming on. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate it. It's great it. to have you again. Thanks for sharing your expertise. Thank thanks you for much. coming on. I want to thank uh, my control room guy, Mike. Thanks so much. And all the folks at Blue Chip Marketing for producing Get Secure and for Arrow Security for sponsoring this show. So see you again next week, everybody. Have a safe week. Remember, get Arrow, get secure.